A very warm welcome to the Scottish Law Agents to my messy study. I hope that quite quickly I'll be able to reward you for your coming to visit by giving you a neat bibliography of this subject of diligence. Let me start with the statutes. Uh, there really are only three that I need to tell you about. The Debtors Scotland Act 1987, the Debt Arrangement and Attachment Act 2002, and the Bankruptcy and Diligence etc. Scotland Act uh, 2007. The uh, 2007 Act uh, has had the effect of uh, dispersing uh, many of the of its uh, statutory changes amongst the other two statutes, and it's perhaps a strange thing that, given the comparatively compact size of these uh, statutes, uh, although the uh, Bankruptcy and Diligence etc. Scotland Act was the biggest uh, bill and the biggest act to have passed through the Scottish Parliament by quite a long way uh, at the time of, of its uh, gaining royal assent in 2007. But given the fact that this is not an enormous uh, subject legislatively, it's perhaps strange or at least worth commenting on the fact that all the legislation doesn't end up having been put in the one statute. So let me let me explain. Uh, much of the uh, the uh, innovations brought in by the two thousand and seven Act uh, find their way being placed either in the nineteen eighty seven uh, Act or the two thousand and two Act. But it's really rather odd the way the laws have been divided up between the three statutes. Um, let me let me explain. Uh, the 1987 Act, as it presently uh, stands, uh, uh, contains uh, much of what was in it originally, uh, but it has been shorn of its uh, important part uh, when it uh, dealt with the uh, modernization of pendings and warrant sales. And Little did we sheriff officers suppose that uh, the system of pendings and warrant sales having been reformed in 1987 and not really having been looked at very thoroughly uh, since uh, 1838, uh, little did we uh, suspect that uh, by the year uh, 1999, the call for the abolition of pendings and warrant sales uh, would be a very live political issue. And indeed that in 2002, uh, statute of the Scottish Parliament would abolish pendings and warrant sales. Um, but I'm not to tell you of what the 1987 Act used to have, I want to tell you what it has now if you look at it uh, on the, uh, the legislative website. Uh, part uh, 1A, 1A uh, was inserted by the 2007 Act into the 1987 Act and it deals with diligence on the dependence. Uh, part 3, which was always part of the 1987 Act, deals with diligence against earnings. And Part 3a deals with arrestment in execution, uh, this having been a part contributed for it by the 2007 Act. The points to make. The 1987 Act does not cover the replacement diligence for pendings and warrant sales, which are attachments and auctions, they're kept in a different statute. And the 1987 Act, whilst it deals with inhibition on the dependence, does not deal with inhibition in execution. Now let's come to the 2002 Act as it presently stands in the, step, in the statute book subject to the various amendments. It has a part 1a contributed by the 2007 Act on interim attachment. It has its original part 2 on attachment and it has its original part 3 on attachment of articles kept in dwelling houses. What's to comment is 
What it does not include is the new diligence created in 2007 of money attachment. And now finally we come to the 2007 Act as it presently stands in the statute book. Uh, part 5 deals with inhibition in execution and I've already told you that it has uh, transferred inhibition on the dependence to the 1987 Act. Uh, part 8 deals with money attachment and I've already raised my eyebrows that the other sorts of uh, attachment uh, uh, in dwelling houses and outside dwelling houses is dealt with not in 2007 Act but in 2002 Act. Uh, and it also deals at uh, part 15 with actions of removing. And in mentioning the actions for removing I'll get presently to considering the definitions of diligence and this question of removings is quite an interesting one in determining the scope of the definition of diligence. It also does not cover land attachment notwithstanding the fact that part 4 of the 2007 Act enacts a statutory system of land attachment. The reason for that is that part of the statute has not yet been commenced. It is not in force. And nor does the 2007 Act give a statutory authority for disclosure orders, uh, a way of being able to provide official information which gives information allowing diligence to be more effective. Uh, the reason for that is that although disclosure was part was part 16 of the 2007 Act as passed, it too has not been commenced. That part is not in force. These then are the uh, statutes that you need to know about. And the next part of this bibliography, I thought I would mention two handy resources available online, uh, which give an account of the scope of uh, diligence, as it presently stands, I would, I, I would say. Uh, and the first one comes from an official website of the European Union, uh, the European Judicial Network in Civil and Commercial Matters, the pages relating to Scotland, uh, provides a very interesting, thorough, yet not too long account of the whole system uh, of what we would uh, regard as being encompassed by the subject of diligence. And let me mention another European website. Uh, it comes from the site of the European Bailiffs Foundation, and uh, the pages relate to the European Judicial enforcement project. Uh, and now it ill behoves me to praise too highly the e-notes that you will find on that website telling you about Scotland and how judgments are enforced in Scotland. Uh, well, I was the author uh, of the uh, information on that website. Uh, the information is somewhat out of date, particularly in regard to the fees which are payable uh, for the various stages in diligence, uh, yet I hope that you will still find it a useful read and uh, the slide will provide you with all the contact information that you need to be able to find these two uh, resources on the World Wide Web. The next Part, part of the bibliography is what I, I, we might term uh, the literary department. I'd like to mention three books to you, one from the 18th century, one from the 19th and one from the 20th century. Uh, the 18th century book, uh, Lord Keynes's Historical Law Tracts. Uh, now, uh, published in 1758, I think it's a, a, a wonderful fruit of the uh, Scottish Enlightenment. And I'll mention just three of the tracts which I think are of particular interest to us. 
And the first one is his tract 9, History of Process in Absence. And in mentioning that title, uh, you will probably be thinking, what is that to do with diligence? Note, please, I haven't given you any definition of diligence yet, but I think we all have a notion that we know what we mean it's to do with execution uh, for unpaid debts that have been constituted by a decree or are recoverable under any other legal provision. But this is talking about appearing in the cause. And Kames writes, the compulsion to force the defendant to appear was attachment of his movables to the possession of which he was restored upon finding bail. Now his comments uh, are about the medieval period and he is comparing the English and the Scottish uh, procedure for being able to grant judgment in absence. He presents it that in England it's impossible to grant uh, a judgment in absence because it's essential that the, uh, the defendant uh, enters, enters uh, appearance and makes a plea. But there it is, he does explain the earliest form of the attachment of movables has the purpose of compelling a litigant party, the litigant to appear in court. Uh, the next track, track number 10, uh, is more obviously uh, um, subject uh, for diligence. History of execution against movables and land for payment of debt. And tract 11 is also relevant, but much less so to current practice, I am very glad to say, history of personal execution for payment of debt. And personal execution in this context means uh, imprisonment for debt. And uh, personal uh, diligence, and having mentioned the Personal Diligence Scotland Act of 1838, was one of the many misleading terms which went on in the past because personal diligence in that context means diligence against movables didn't actually mean diligence against the person. Uh, not for the first time in this lecture you will discover that people use the same word and mean completely different things by it. Uh, from the uh, tract 11, History of Personal Execution, however, uh, there is this uh, interesting statement made, an aphorism, we might even call it, uh, which guides us through finding divisions for the subject of diligence. The subjects that lie open to execution for payment of debt are, firstly, the debtor's movables, secondly, his land, and thirdly, his person. And Keynes explains that personal execution for payment of debt, that's uh, imprisonment, was introduced long after execution against land, and execution against land was introduced long after execution against movables. He also tells us what might be regarded as a hierarchy in the process of being realizing a debtor's assets for payment of a debt when he writes the movables as of less importance than the land should be first sold. The 19th century book is this weighty tome, The Law of Diligence by J. Graham Stewart, advocate, published by Greens in 1898. I'm going to be giving you a reading from it presently. And the third of the books, the 20th century one, Law and Practice of Diligence by Maher and Cousin, uh, published in 1990. And uh, little did I imagine then that so much of it would become out of date and so remarkably quickly. Uh, but it still holds good for uh, uh, much of the subject and is a useful read. And in having told you of those three statutes, two websites and three books, that concludes my offering of the select bibliography.
Now, since this is a lecture devoted to the subject of diligence, I'd like to spend some time on a definition for diligence. Uh, Maher and Kassen give us a wonderful book of 428 pages on the law and practice of diligence, but I'm not sure the book actually contains a definition. The Scottish Law Commission have given us definitions, but uh, none uh, complete in itself and covering all possible meanings. But I think the best place to start are with the various publications of the Scottish Law Commission. The 1985 Report on Diligence and Data Protection, page one, footnote number two, says diligence is the legal term used to denote primarily the methods of enforcing unpaid debts due under decrees of the Scottish courts. The Scottish Law Commission's first memorandum on diligence, and that's going back to 1980, uh, publishes this, page one, also footnote two, diligence is the Scottish legal term denoting the measures, such as arrestments of wages or pendings and warrant sales, which can be taken to enforce civil court decrees ordering the payment of debts or the implement of other legal obligations and includes also measures to secure property pending a court action, namely arrestments and inhibitions on the dependents. Its main purpose is to compel people to pay the debts which they have incurred and which the courts have ordered them to pay. And the Scottish Law Commission's final report on diligence published 2001, also page one, but footnote one says, more briefly than ever, diligence is the legal term used primarily to denote the methods for enforcing unpaid debts due under court decrees. So much for definitions, but what of etymology? Uh, for that, we really need to go back to Graham Stewart, uh, he produces a book of 893 pages. Uh, I'd like to give you a brief reading from the introduction when he considers the word diligence. The origin of the term diligence is, notwithstanding much learned research and speculation, still doubtful. Lord Stair says that the precepts, writs, executorials and compulsators sanctioned by law to aid the creditor in recovering his debt are called diligences because they excuse the users thereof from negligence, whereby posterior diligences being exactly followed are preferable to prior diligences being neglected, which is founded upon that great interest to hasten pleas to an end. They are also called diligences because though the effect do not follow, yet the user thereof hath endeavoured what he could, and so is held as in the same case as if he had obtained the command of the precept. These precepts are called executorials before executions be thereupon, but they are only called diligences when they are executed in due time. The end of the quotation from Stair. <clears throat> and Graham Stewart continues, Mr. Ross in his lectures characterises Stair's view as merely an ingenious conjecture founded upon the common ac ac acceptation of the word diligence and proposes to find the true origin in the still subsisting French law term diligence, meaning a suit. The probability is that both learned authors are right owing to the intimate connection which subsisted between this country and France, the influence of French customs can clearly be traced in the forms of judicial and executorial procedure used in this country. While the term, therefore, would prob probably had its origin in the word diligentia as used in Roman law, it would, like so much else of our legal phraseology, reach us through the French. Well, I remember being interested hearing the phrase à la diligence de quelqu'un, uh, which in French just means at the instance of. Well, they also in French have the word l'instance, uh, but diligence can just mean instance uh, in French. I'm quite in 
intrigued by the fact that Graham Stewart uh, says, well, both these uh, authorities had, uh, had right on their side. Uh, Ross is right to call attention to French usage, and Stair is right also to suppose that uh, the word diligence uh, and its ordinary meaning of the careful attention that is given to something uh, goes a long way to explaining what's, what is going on in Scotland, having uh, come to regard diligence as a technical legal term, meaning the procedure for the enforcement of court decrees or the enforcement of documents uh, of debt uh, registered for execution. Now you've come here because uh, you want to hear a messenger at arms and sheriff officer's view of diligence. Uh, and in this context, perhaps it's, meant it's relevant for me to uh, mention something about perseverance of arms. Uh, you didn't come here to learn about heraldry, but I'm a messenger at arms, and it's not, a, it's not by chance that the messengers at arms might speak to you about the laws of arms, because the messenger at arms is to this day still appointed to office by the Lord Lion King of Arms, and the Lord Lion King of Arms is the senior herald in Scotland and has under him the heralds of arms and the pursuivants um, of arms, as well as the uh, multitude of the messengers, messengers at arms. I mention that because it strikes me as quite interesting that in the 1470s we read of there having been a royal pursuivant in Scotland called diligence pursuivant. And knowing that the work of a pursuivant at that time, and indeed uh, right up until the modern era with the uh, Debtors Act of 1987, knowing that it was possible for a herald and a pursuivant of arms to carry out the uh, offices that were competent of a messenger at arms, uh, one might have thought that in the 1470s we get a clue that uh, these executorial officers of the law uh, are in some way associated with the word diligence. But I think probably it's nothing to do with that. Uh, there's a, a tendency or a rather a nice tradition, particularly amongst the French heralds, of having titles which uh, signify uh, personal traits, uh, quali qualities like uh, loyalty, loyalty perseverant, loyalty perseverant, il divre perseverant, he speaks the truth uh, perseverant. And in Scotland, there's diligence perseverant, and a private person, I think rather than a royal one, but from the same era in the 15th century, endure persevant. So I think we see here that diligence is part of the personal quality of careful, careful and attentive uh, to business. And endure persevant is uh, hardy and faithful in his task. His, he, he endures the task that's set to him. So at that stage, I don't think we see the origins of the, the word of uh, diligence, uh, but at whatever stage it was, uh, this lecture began with us all rather thinking we knew what we meant by the subject of diligence. And I think having discussed at this stage the um, definition of diligence, uh, we come to be pretty clear. It is a nice, a peculiar Scottish term, meaning the enforcement of civil obligations.